al ciclo internacional de paneles inteligencia. Welcome to the session today for the international cycle of panels called phytosanitary intelligence biosecurity its opportunities and implications in Latin America. This cycle of panels began last Monday with a round table through which we were able to analyze and gain further insight about phytosanitary intelligence and how it applies to biosecurity. We heard very interesting presentations from experts and authorities from the region as well as outside of the region. So our panel today, panel two, will focus on phenological modeling of pests. The moderator for this session is Dr. Roberto Tapia Opaso. and I'm going to introduce him. He's an agricultural engineer from the University of Chile with a master's degree from the University of Waterloo and a, a diplomate from, uh, in geomatics from the University of Ottawa in Canada with more than 18 years experience in public uh, phytosanitary spheres. He has worked in the intelligence section of the phytosanitary division of the agricultural and Forestry Protection Service in Chile, and he has uh, work on the work group, working group on intelligence and biosecurity with experts from the Division of Livestock Control, Border Control, and Agriculture and Forestry Protection at the service, at the Agricultural and Livestock Service, the Office of Zoonotic Diseases and Vector Controls at the Ministry of Health, and the Modeling Center. Uh, in mathematics at the Agricultural Engineering Faculty of the University of Chile. Uh, you can take over, uh, Roberto. Thank you so much, Lourdes, for your kind introduction. I'd like to welcome all of you today to this session. So today we're going to uh, exchange information on uh, Phenological modeling of pests. We have a very interesting panel today. It will begin with Dr. Tomislav Kurkovich from the University of Chile. Afterwards, Dr. Thomas Pering from the University of California at Riverside. Then Dr. Juan Angel Quijano. He's an expert in uh, phenological modeling from Mexico. And then uh, we will, the Agricultural uh, and Livestock, and the Agricultural and Livestock Service, and uh, the Department of Environmental Mechanics uh, of the University of Chile will make a presentation along with me. So today we're going to continue with Dr. Thomas Kirkovich and I'll introduce him. He's an agricultural engineer. He's a graduate from the University of Chile in 1990. And he has a PhD in entomology from Washington State University in 2004. The past few years, he has directed or co-directed uh, public tenders, research development, and integrated pest management transfer and use of semiochemicals for pest management and model, pest modeling. He's been a member of the Ministry of Health and Agriculture Advisory Boards for Pesticide Residue Management in Food, Management of Lubesia botrana and Betis, and has interacted intensely for the past few years with the phytosanitary forecast network at the Ministry of Livestock and uh, Agriculture in Chile in pest modeling and forecast. He's published more than 100 publications, uh, scientific and technical publications, that is, has written seven chapters for textbooks and present, made more than 100 presentations at national 
meetings and at 40 international meetings, and he's been invited uh, more than 80 times to different countries, uh, including Chile, Honduras, Peru, Uruguay, Argentina, etc., to uh, make presentations. So you have the floor, Dr. Kukovic. Thank you so much, Roberto and Lourdes, and I'd like to just uh, send my regards out to everyone who is connected to the web webinar. Going to share my screen. So, as Thomas, uh, well, we have been, uh, Dr. Perring, we have been using Zoom uh, almost uh, permanently, but I think uh, for some reason I'm paranoid now. I'm never sure if anyone can see my screen or hear me or see me. So I'm just going to ask all of you to give me a thumb, thumbs up or let me know if you can hear me and see my screen. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, I'd like to thank you all for inviting me to this international cycle of panels on phytosanitary intelligence and biosecurity. Uh, and the fact that we're going to share experiences uh, in Latin America and the region. And today we'll address phenological modeling of pests. And this is the work that we've uh, carried out for the past uh, few years. This is my group and it's a moth, it's a moth, uh, Cerro Laudaria. It's a very important moth in Chile. So. I work at the University of Chile, the Plant Health Protection Department or the Crop Protection Department, and we received funding from the National Research and Development uh, Department, and it's part of the Chilean government. And this is our research team. And uh, we have Dr. Luis Morales from the University of Chile, Dr. Pablo Gutierrez, uh, University of Ilias, Dr. Zeneda from the University, uh, Catholic University of Mali in Chile, Roberto Tapia from the SAG, Diego Arrazio, PhD student from Mineleva, a master's student. So let me just uh, give you all some uh, background. Because if I speak about the uh, coffee moth, uh, people have an idea of what I'm speaking about. But when I speak about uh, Porelio Lauralia, uh, most of you don't even know what I'm speaking about. Uh, well, it's specific almost to Chile and parts of Argentina. It's uh, Chrysopteris. It's uh, a, a fruit. It's from the uh, fruit families, uh, the pear or Chilean leaf roller, or the Trotisinae family, which has the habit of being a leaf roller, as uh, we say. The the genus that's basically Chilean and uh, 37, uh, 41 species, 37 of them are in Chile. So it's endemic to this area. And it's uh, it's three are economically important. Uh, P. Chrysopteris, P. Trictra, and P. Auraria, known as the peritillian leaf roller, orange leaf roller, or grape leaf roller. And you could see them uh, to the right. And I've circled the uh, the insect of interest to us today. It is a polyphic, polyphagous uh, host, it's, and it's a species that's uh, a native species. And here are some common names. And it generally uh, grows on on this native uh, these on native plants, ornamental weeds, ornamentals, weeds, uh, oriental sycamore, eliga, etc. And the Galiga is uh, on the upper right-hand side. And economically, it's uh, very common. It's polyphagous in uh, fruit species. And they are very important for Chile's uh, fruit uh, export uh, business and of significant economic importance because it uh, impacts berries. Uh, blueberries, stone fruits, uh, and uh, citrus fruit. It's been uh, reported that it's a significant uh, 
problems and many other groups, including grapes. And together with palm fruits, this is uh, where the species will uh, be truly devastating. And you can see the larvae that it, uh, it forms a, you can see that it, it, it is very difficult to treat and and it literally grow into a cocoon uh, by weaving silk. So for totricides, it lays its eggs, approximately 30 eggs uh, per uh, plate, and a woman can, or sorry, a female sorry, can lay up to uh, 30 eggs. And here we see uh, there are five larval stages to the right. We can see one, three, and five uh, odd, and we see some uh, morphological uh, implications. And then in the middle, we see the chrysalia, and then we also see the larva, and the adults. You could see that it's its abdomen, and it was taken uh, through a uh, glass window, and you can see how uh, they lay their eggs, uh, these larval instars. So damage has to do with with this uh, with this habit of folding, of folding, of bending, as we see in the picture to the right, and we see a folded leaf, uh, a leaf folded by by the by the larva, and it's on my hand <laughs> in that picture. And it's very important to uh, note that because it impacts the early development of the plant's architecture. It also attacks leaves uh, later on in the period. And you could see it could cause uh, superficial damage, but especially uh, make reject make fruit that's exported be rejected that's the main uh that's the main quandary that we faced so we also see that it may be uh, confused with uh, fungi but what's most important uh, in chile is that it's pretty much a reason for quarantine rejections if larvae are detected during inspection uh, during export, if they are detected on the fruit, then once they're detected, uh, the fruit will immediately be rejected. Here are some uh, figures. They're not completely updated, but uh, millions of dollars are lost per year uh, because of this species. So we've studied this uh, species for 10 years now. First, we identified the sex pheromone uh, of this species after a monitoring campaign to get to know the egg curves. And here are some areas where we conducted our observation. There are two, sorry, not, not eggs, flight. Uh, during spring, we see in the Southern Hemisphere and during the summer, uh, during the start of the summer as well, uh, there's no activity within uh, of adults in uh, during the fall during the winter and we see uh beta traps for uh totuia and this is in the center of chile 130 kilometers south of chile and that's where we captured uh various uh, uh various males and the flight pattern has been repeated in different uh, areas so the study has focused on uh, being able to detect thermal parameters of a PRLia to be able to develop an early warning system against this pest. As since they already exist in Chile, Lobesia botana, or the uh, or the moth, or the cluster moth. Uh, so for this, we required a colony of uh, samples of the pests to be able to have many specimens and carry out individual follow-up to 
he from the time of development until the time uh, that uh, they lay eggs. So we went out into the field and we uh, fed them an artificial diet. And then we, uh, the adults that emerged from this material uh, in uh, different uh, climate chambers. And uh, we know the uh, we know the uh, times at which they were born, at which they developed, and and they were kept in these uh, climate cha uh, these climate controlled uh, chambers or boxes at seven to thirty five uh, degrees Celsius. What are the overall results? Well. This is one divided by the number of days that a particular stage took to be completed at the different temperatures. Here to the left of the table, we see the first column with the temperatures. And then we see the temperatures at which we raised the larvae. They're registered periodically in a data logger to establish uh, the curve at which this species has been maintained, and we keep them between 9 and 31 degrees, and uh, conduct follow-up uh, for eggs. The second column, it shows the development uh, rate. This It's one divided by the number of days that an egg uh, took to develop at 9.0518. Uh, so the development uh, rate goes up as the temperature goes up in all stages, but uh, we noted in some that the development rates at very high temperatures uh, begin to uh, to uh, drop. And that's important to understand with regards to how we analyze the information later on. So we did this uh, for eggs at each of the larval stages by defining the uh, development rate. So, there's still uh, some data that we need to uh, gather, of course. So traditionally, uh, literature uh, for many years used lineal models to be able to uh, reflect uh, development rates at different temperatures. But for some years now, I would say, uh, in the last decade, uh, nonlinear models have been used to adjust these values because you see that the response is not lineal. And we can see that many of the models uh, that we've uh, used are shown here. In order to define the most appropriate model, we use statistics. And at the end, they uh, determine the best adjustments. And then we select the modeling that best represents uh, or reflects nature. Or, and then we model it. Uh, we perform the phenological modeling. Here are, here are the different uh, stages and their graphs uh, with trend lines. And it shows the development rates against the temperature. The response is not is nonlinear. So in addition to offering the opportunity to determine uh, upper uh, thresholds that will uh, allow the development at very high temperatures and uh, the lower threshold values. So we can see both at which the uh, eggs of the species will develop. So given these models, we can extract uh, the different uh, heat uh, temperatures that are, the heat temperature that is required. And these are the thermal requirements for each stage. So for, for each stage, we obtain the three parameters. The uh, upper and inferior uh, thresholds, and then the development rate. So what are the uh, values of these thermal parameters that we've obtained for the best adjusted models? Generally, it's the Briar fitted model that works the best. And for staging, uh, or instar, egg, larvae, etc. cetera, pupae, we can see them. We see uh, lower thermal thresholds. The minimum 
can figure out which development begins for each of the stages and the upper thermal thresholds uh, where development stops at very high temperatures and degree, degrees and days required for completion of the development. We know that this species under certain conditions requires 1,069 days to complete their cycle from the egg to the pupae, and then the emergence of the adults. These are the uh, weighted thermal thresholds, and this is for all the stages that can be useful for us, especially if we're trying to develop early warning systems. And to uh, be able to provide better oversight of the pests for farmers out in the field. So, here we see the uh, habitual procedure, which is to uh, validate thermal parameters. Uh, it's the day was established uh, for the completion of the different stages of development in the field. And what this reflects here is that the data observed uh, versus the what was uh, projected by the models coincide. And this, to a certain extent, helps us conclude that the parameters that we obtained are pretty trustworthy and robust. So we've done uh, a forecast of a flight forecast in three areas of the central region. So we've seen the last slide. Uh, we've been able to uh, gain the thermal, uh, the thresholds obtained for study were used to calculate degree days during previous seasons where the flight was monitored. That's the red line and where we were able to register the uh, flight of the males. So the red line shows the true uh, behavior or trend out in the field. And then we've calculated the beginning and the end of flight uh, that was forecasted and observed. And we see that uh, there's a significant uh, overlap or, or it coincides. And we see that in the triangle triangles. And with uh, fewer than seven days as uh, a deviation from, from uh, what is but pretty much it matched reality with regards to the uh, purple triangles, which is what we forecasted. So these are linear models. Uh, and that's where in linear models, that's where these differences would be perceived. And we see that in general, uh, the uh, if we use the thermal parameters and observation, uh, it pretty much coincides. So it's pretty uh, exact. So it matches. So this leads to the development of early warming systems that uh, Dr. Safi is going to speak about later on. But these uh, systems are truly uh, interesting for uh, users, for uh, farmers, for ex technical experts, because Chile, through its SAG, uh, has a system where users are able to uh, visualize how the test of, of interest uh, PR area develops. So, for example, here we're in a white stage, but we can see how the system provides uh, the farmer with a map where the color coded and it shows uh, based on the colors how far the pest has uh, advanced. So it's easy to understand and it uh, conveys or communicates any events uh, tied to, to species uh, having to do uh, from the start that the eggs are laid to the time they hatch, for example. And the idea is to be able to uh, gain better uh, insecticide control. So where it's a bit redder, we can see that this is a, a hot zone, and that's where pesticide needs to be applied against this pest. So the strategy selected for this purpose is chemical control. 
So just to conclude, we were able to obtain the three thermal parameters using nonlinear models. So this was a bit uh, challenging, quantitatively speaking, but the uh, forecast for the first flight uh, was significantly improved uh, compared to the pre-existing model. And that's important for this past PR area because its life cycle is very uh, heterogeneous. And at the beginning of the uh, stage, it has a different development stage based on the uh, conditions of out in the field. So we have to analyze this based on each stage to be able to uh, carry out more robust uh, predictions that can be used for the uh, different population groups. So as we, we still haven't finished this research, but for the first flight, uh, it seems that uh, the models tend to match uh, the observations and the predictions. And it's uh, much better than pre-existing models. So an important conclusion for us is that since we've uh, determined the thermal requirements and the days uh, required uh, for the species to complete a generation based on these requirements and what we've calculated out of the field, we could at least uh, know that this species needs to complete, uh, will complete three generations uh, during a stage uh, during its flight patterns. Thank you so much for your attention and I will be uh, answering questions at the end. Muchas gracias, muchas gracias, Tomislav. Eh, excelente presentación. Eh, Thank you, Tomislav. That was a great presentation. If we have any questions from the panelists, we can open the floor for questions or comments. Dr. Tomás Perrin o Dr. Juan. Either by. No. Dr. Quijano or Dr. Perring, any questions or comments? Sí, Dr. Ángel. Ángel, doctor, go ahead. Sí. Gracias, doctor. Eh, Thank you. Eh, veo, mostró datos de I see you have data of traps uh, of the adults. The end information you were saying about the degree days makes us uh, believe or makes you believe that there's three generations. Can you verify that with the trap data? Well, we're actually doing that. To be quite honest, what we find when we do the pheromone trap uh, monitoring, it very efficiently reflects the reality of the field. And so we see this as two cycles. If you remember, the figure showed two cycles quite prolonged uh, cycles, and that's not very common to have such prolonged cycles. The first one might make more sense because spring in Chile, uh, the degree day accumulation is uh, lower in certain uh, elevations. And the second cycle, up until before this study, we believed there were two generations. Um, literature in Chile and field experience has also suggested between two and three generations. So it's not quite clear there, except for citrix, uh, citrus fruits. These are perennials, so they give us the option uh, of larvae developing throughout the year. It's not the same for grapevines and apples that uh, don't have any uh, leaves or fruit during the winter. Having said that, we are verifying that in lab conditions. So there we have uh, produced five continuous generations per season in laboratories. So three is not necessarily um, out of the question. Now, looking at these results that were a bit surprising, we can expect it, at least if, look, if we look at what we've had in the lab. We are trying to validate that at this time. We have relative certainty that that first large flight corresponds to one generation considering the thermal accumulation. That is confirmed. 
and then the drop in uh, captures is because we don't have such a large adult population. What could happen is that those two generations are overlapping. And so it's not very easy to see when you look at the graphs and curves. Thank you very much for the question. And uh, we will leave some space for more questions and comments at the end so that we can uh, refer to the different presentations. So with that, we will have the next presentation. Thank you, Dr. Krukovich, for yours. We now have Dr. Thomas Perring giving us his presentation. He is professor and vice chair of the entomology department in California University, Riverside. Dr. Perring's research group conducts basic and applied research aimed at developing environmentally and economically sustainable pest management programs for insects and mites that are threats to agricultural crops, particularly in desert agroecosystems. Subsets of this research effort include studies on the epidemiology and management of arthropod vectors of plant pathogens in a variety of agricultural commodities, evaluations of insecticides and miticides for safer, more effective treatments, and the use of natural enemies for management of the Bagrada bug and the pink hibiscus mealybug. With that, we now give the floor to Dr. Thomas Perring. And you may go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you. It's very nice to see you. Um, just let me know, can you see the screen and can you hear my voice? Everything good? Well, it's certainly a pleasure to be here. Um, I've met many of you before in Chile. It was a very nice visit. I'm going to talk a little about that. But um, So again, Roberto and Lourdes, thank you for the invitation to uh, talk about this. I'm asking a question today from a really an applied entomologist's perspective. Can we use phenological data to improve climate matching models um, for predicting Bagrata hilaris? Let me tell you a little about this insect. Bagrata hilaris is a, it's a warm season pest. It likes warm temperatures but it eats crops that are cool season crops. And those are the brassicaceous crops, broccoli, cauliflower, those kinds of crops. The problem becomes when it attacks those crops very early in the season. And in my region, we plant, we plant seeded bro broccoli and cauliflower crops we plant them in the very end of our very hot summer. And then we use sprinklers, as in this slide, to help the seeds germinate and to actually cool the soil so that the plants can germinate. At this time of year, it's at the end of our summer, so we are actually going into the winter season, the cooler season. And that's where these coal crops, that's where they grow. Is my speed about right? Should I slow a little bit? How, okay. Well, this is what a, one of our fields would look like. And the issue is, is that when we put the seed in the ground and when the seed starts to take in water to get ready to, to open up, the Bagrata bug literally can smell Coal crops have a, a, a lots of, of very um, volatile chemicals and it attracts the insects. And I'm going to, I'm going to draw your attention to this right here. And I'm gonna do a highlight. These are Bagrata bugs and they are sitting right on top of where there's a seed planted. 
and you can you can see them down the road, literally waiting for the seed to come out of the ground. It's incre it's incredible. It's incredible. These feed by lacerating and flush. They put their stylets in the leaves, and it causes these star-shaped lesions on the foliage. There's nothing, nothing like it. You cannot miss it in the field. So when the seed germinates, starts to grow, and it cotyledons come out of the ground, the bagrata bug are already feeding on it. And they will kill that seedling before it ever puts on a true leaf. So this is what the leaf should look like. This is one of our American coins, a dime, which is small. Three days after emergence, and you can see this cotyledon is, is dead because the bagrata bugs have killed it. What happens then is when you kill those seedlings, you have a field that can be up to 90% what the plants are missing. So it's devastating to the farmer. They have to replant their field. If the plants do escape, and grow, the, bu the bug will feed on the top of the plant. It will kill the terminal. And so we end up with broccoli plants that have no, there's no fruit. They just grow and we call those blind plants. There's no fruit growing on the top of the plant. Or it'll grow these multiple stems that you see and the heads will be very small. It's a devastating thing. Sometimes on cauliflower, there'll be multiple heads rather than one nice head, multiple heads that are growing around the, on the plant. Bagrata comes from Africa and the Middle East. It's a problem in many parts of the world where brassicaceous plants are grown. It came into California in June of 2008. Very quickly, and this is where it came in here, right in California on the, on the, in Los Angeles County. Very quickly, it moved across to the eastern U.S., northern California, and really moved into Mexico, where these crops are grown, even all the way over here to Texas. So in a very short period of time, Bagrata moved very rapidly. Well, in September of 2016, it was discovered in Chile. A very nice paper by Fondas et al. in 2016. And the first sightings of it were here in Kitakura. And then that was in September. And in November, December, it had moved into Lampa. So not so uncommon that it would come in here in to the airport in Santiago, where there's maybe materials that are moving from other parts of the world into there. But the rapid movement in just a very few short months uh, from that location out into Lampa, and then it quickly spread by March of the next year, it had spread and so that, that SAG had enforced um, uh, management rules and the metropolitan region, and then as well as in the Valparaiso region of Chile. So very rapid movement of this insect. And it's not a particularly good flyer, but we do know one thing that it moves around a lot with produce into different regions. Well, all of that resulted in an ability or an invitation to me to visit Chile. And so I came there and met many of you. I hope those of you who are on this call are looking at this picture. It was a very good time. And we visited Lampa, a couple of places, spent some time in the field with growers, um, um, a lot of the research community. Uh, again, many of you who are hopefully watching in and on this call. Uh, we went to Valparaiso and you, every place we went, we could find Bergrata in September, moving into the into your growing season. This is very early in the growing season, still very cold. 
but there were active Bragrata. And uh, again, I, I just uh, went to Curacavi and did more work there and looked at the agricultural situations in each of these regions. And then based upon that, uh, again, with the help of many of you on the call, uh, Pamela Ibanez Arias and I put together a technical report that um, that had long term, long, short term, mid term, and long term uh, recommendations, and and I understand that many of those have been followed, and and I'm looking forward now to possibly coming back to Chile once we get out of COVID to see how how things are going. So that that's one of my dreams to do, and maybe looking at uh, maybe this time next year. I think we might be clear of COVID by then, and maybe have our vaccinations. So I look forward to that. One of the one of the opportunities that I had when I was in Chile is on the second day of my visit, there was a, a, a big symposium. And, uh, and I was really impressed that um, Luis Morales and, R and Roberto presented this graph of a, a climate matching model that predicted where the Grata Hilaris, the Grata bug, would become a problem in Chile. I was very impressed that in that very short amount of time from the, its, its arrival to here that, that so much research had been done. And I started thinking at that time, and I've been thinking in the US, I also had a colleague who was doing some climate matching modeling. And, and then in 2019, a more robust study was done looking at the potential distribution of, of Bagrata worldwide. And this map shows uh, basic climate matching models, looking mostly at temperature and other climatic variables and how that would predict the distribution. And what we see is the red areas are where it's predicted to be bad. The black areas is areas where it's predicted not to occur, and the yellow is um, in some medial media area there. Okay, so all along I've been thinking these climate matching models are, let me start and go back, are really nice tools to give us some predictions about where we might see these insects. But I wondered if we have data, like uh, Thomas Love just presented on the phenological data, you know, real life laboratory type data, can those be used in any way to, to help refine these broader climate matching models, which are based upon where known distributions are and then matching the climates of those regions to other places in the world. So I asked this question, can they be used to improve climate matching models? Now, I'm just gonna share uh, pretty much what Thomas Love just showed for his past for Bagrata. We obtained insects from the field. We collected their eggs. We divided those up between the different temperatures. 30 eggs per temperature. So this, this I'm just gonna talk about this. These are collections of Bagrata from our field. We brought them back in and these are the eggs that they lay in plastic containers. Okay, we put those in small dishes, one single egg so we could mo monitor individual development over the lifetime of them. They had a little piece of broccoli to keep them fed. Again, this is just the experimental setup and lots and lots of data. Thomas Love would, he would agree that these studies generate a lot of data. I'm not gonna spend any time on this slide except to say the important thing that I'm going to be using is the combined total development from the egg stage all the way through the fifth instar till they become adults. And 
Since these insects are also poikilotherms, their development depends on the temperature. You can see that it's fairly slow. These are the numbers of days it took to develop at 24 degrees Celsius, and it gets shorter and shorter as you go up to a point, okay? And then the development becomes longer at higher temperature, at some higher temperature. Well, you can take those data, graph them. Again, thank you for the introduction, Thomas Love, on your presentation. You map the data. Because it's a curvilinear, you use a, one of many different models. We tested a number of models on our data. The Breer 1 model, there's a Breer 2 model. The Breer 1 model was the best fit of our data. But the thing that becomes really important is this linear part of the curve. And that's used to do some very important things. First of all, that line is represented by this equation. The development is a function of two um, variables and the temperature. It's a standard linear regression, linear regression model. So once you have these data, it's very simple to plot out and to determine what the A and the B of this is. And so you can determine at various temperatures. The cumulative degree days, or the amount of time it takes to develop through from egg to adult, can be determined by if you have this letter B, it's just one over B, and you can determine what the cumulative degree days are how long it takes to develop from egg to adult. That's basically one generation, right? Okay. By the way, you can read all this and look at all the different models we used on a paper that, that uh, one of my research associates uh, published in 2017. Well, here are those, ver those values for the Grotta Hilaris. The minimum temperature for development is 16.7. The maximum where they die is 42.7. And then there's an optimum at 36. So if you go back, the minimum comes out right here. The maximum is here at 42. And that 36 is up here on the optimum. Okay. Now, I really want you to focus in on these degree days because I did a little analysis. When I asked this question, I wasn't sure what would happen. But I'm going to go back and I'm going to go back to that Carvajal paper. And I'm going to pick two situations, one in the United States and one in Chile. If we look at the United States, and this is just the climate match model, this is where the climate would predict where we were gonna have problems. I took three areas within that red of California. So one up in the Northern part of California, one on the Southern coast, and one in our inland desert. Cause I know the temperature conditions of those three are very different. Okay. I went to our weather station monitoring program called CEMIS, and I pulled down all of the daily average temperatures from April of last year to yesterday, just to see what the data would look like. And you can see they're very different. The California deserts, much higher temperature. The coast, is down here on the bottom, okay? And then Northern California runs fairly close to the coast, but it's in the mid middle part. I then use these data to accumulate degree days. So I just simply took the lower temperature for development. A degree day then becomes the average temperature for a day, you subtract out the lower development and whatever remains there, 
the insect grows during those number of days. Okay. So cumulative degree days then for our three different areas are very different. And when you know that those cumulative degree days of 272, let me just go 270 some, of turn, um, calculates to this many generations of our three areas. So from 2.7 generations to 10.5 generations within that one red area determined by the climate matching model. So clearly, that climate matching model is very, very good, and it gives a generalization. But the more data points that you have within that area, the more you can start defining how really serious is Bagrata going to be within that large area. Okay. Now, in, with these generations, you can still get pretty good damage with three generations per year. So but it's not gonna be nearly the damage you're gonna have with 10 and a half generations per year. So in this case, for sure, you can refine that model. But let's look at Chile. I picked three locations within the red zone in Chile. This is a Southern location, more of a location around Santiago, um, and then one a little bit North of that. Chile has got a much smaller climate matching zone than California does. And so these are the three weather stations that I that I pulled from. Chiguyante in the south, Lopinto, which is very close to, um, to Lampa, and then just a little bit north, the Catapilco area. And from these weather stations, I obtained these data beautiful thing about Chile is it's got this agrometeorologia, which is wonderful. And I was able to calculate these or obtain these average temperatures. So now what does that look like with our degree day model? Well, in Chiguyante, the best you're going to produce is about a half a generation. So that area let me just go back. So that area down here, now admittedly, it's getting down where there's a lot more yellow, but I'm still well within the red. This is an area that could be a problem. So clearly, it's not going to have but a half a generation. So that's not likely to become a serious issue there. In Lampa, yeah, you're looking about like um, northern coast and coastal California. So that's where problems are going to be very big. And that's, I guess, my guess is that's where the problems have been large. And then if we move up even a little bit north of Lampa uh, to Catapulco, again, we're about a half a generation per year. Now, I realize these weather stations might be in higher altitudes and might be giving some, some false uh, cold data. But, but the point of this is that for sure, these phenological data can improve our climate matching models. And if they could be overlaid now on the great work that's already been done for every place in the world that's got a good climate uh, monitoring program, I think we could get more precision on our predictions for the hilarious distributions. Now, to be fair, uh, Carvajal et al. in their paper didn't stop with just the climate matching. This map here then is a refined map based upon crop uh, crop layers and sort of human footprint and agriculture. And so you can see now the blue here is less likely to be a problem, the red, and it maps pretty close to where your problems are. So um, I don't want to give the impression that this paper only looked at climate, it also looked at other variables in there and then we find the model. But once again, I think that the phenological data that there seems to be a lot of that for a lot of different pests could be used on these, on these uh, uh, worldwide prediction models 
that have been produced. And so it's interesting and would like to just bring that up and leave that as perhaps it's something that all people that are really good modelers and, and good um, uh, climate matching modelers and, and world prediction models have already have already locked into that. Um, but I bring it up as, an, as a possibility. Yeah, so this is this is that. Uh, so interestingly enough, and then I'm just going to uh, close my presentation. Interestingly enough, about in 2016, La Grotta started to disappear in California to a point to where we don't really have a problem now with the insect. We've done a lot of work to try and figure that out. And we know now that there are a lot of parasitoids that feed on the eggs or utilize the eggs of other stink bugs that are now hitting the grotta. So we placed sentinel egg cards out in the field and we recovered these species, Trisocus basalis, Trisocus hyalinopinus. The interesting thing about hyalinopinus is that is a that's a parasitoid that's only known from the Middle East. It had never been seen in California. Now, we believe that our Bagrata actually came here from the Middle East, and it's really possible that this parasitoid came in in those early years with the original Bagrata bugs. But we found this in the field in California. No one had released it yet. Um, there are two other species, Trisocus hutaensis and Trisocus hulensis, and these are also have been found on our Bergrata bugs. And then there's two other species. One is Oensertus mirus, uh, which we recently have synonymized with Californicus. And then another species we've been working on, Oensertus lucidus, which we recently described. And these are two other Lucidus has not been released yet, but uh, Oensertus mirus is out there. So we believe that this suite of parasitoids has come in and basically started to utilize the grotta to the point to where it really is not that consistent annual problem. We still have areas where you will see some outbreaks, but it's not the problem that it used to be. And so in this case, the biological control kind of came in and started working for us. So that's all I'm going to uh, to say now. I'm happy to take any questions or wait till later, however we want to go, Roberto. Thank you, Dr. Perrin. Thank you very much. Very interesting Gracias, doctor. Uh, presentation. Uh, we are involved as a country in your presentation and experience, and that is, is very nice for us and interesting. Um, now we, we will continue with the next presentation. Um, all the questions, we, we, will, we will have a, a, a time at the end of the, of, of the, uh, the four presentation. Then now uh, we will start with the presentation of, uh, sorry. Ahora vamos a... Languages? <laughs> We're going to hear uh, Juan Angel Quijano now. Carranza is an agricultural engineer uh, as from Nueva León, Mexico, from the Autonomous University, Masters in uh, Agricultural Production Sciences from that university. He's a PhD in uh, engineering, agricultural engineering and biosystems from the engineering faculty of Querétaro as well. He has 38 years experience as a researcher at the INFAB in Mexico. These are the uh, production agro, agro production systems, modeling, uh, simulation modeling, and agricultural modeling. His research has to do with uh, yield, crop yield uh, forecasting with modeling in early warning systems, uh, phytosanitary warning systems, uh, and execution of uh, agricultural insurance uh, based on uh, climate in indexes and the impact of climate change on agriculture. Since 2009, 
He has been a uh, Senesica's consultant in the uh, epidemiological surveillance program and early warning system. Uh, and he uh, has developed uh, different uh, uh, Program or informatic programs for uh, forecasting purposes. So we'll hear an interesting presentation about uh, phenological modeling and how it relates to uh, pests, uh, grasshoppers, for example. Welcome. Let me just share my screen. Yes, of course. Me, me escuchan y se ve ahí. I just confirm, please, that you can hear me. Gracias. And you can see my screen. Gracias. Wonderful. Thank you. Bien, eh, yes, sir. Pues siguiendo con esa so continuing this interesting uh, look at uh, pest modeling, phenological modeling of pests within the framework of opportunities and implications uh, of in Latin America and how it relates to phytosanitary intelligence and biosecurity. So I'm just going to share some thoughts on, on this. On, on what we consider to be uh, the steps or rather the opportunities that should be followed to take advantage of these phenological modeling uh, to benefit uh, of phytosanitary uh, warning systems. Now, I'm not going to speak about phenological modeling in detail regarding a pest. I'm going to speak uh, in a general sense of our experience in our applications of uh, phenological modeling. I want to speak about the different perspectives and how we should uh, support plant health protection in our country. So let's look at the root of this, the definition of uh, phenology. If we look it up in a dictionary, it will uh, provide a definition that says it's a study of cyclical changes in plant and animal life as a consequence of environmental variations occurred in a region. So given the root of the word, it refers to the different uh, changes uh, that are manifest. So in agriculture, however, the producer and farmers uh, sometimes uh, perceive or uh, they believe they see the appearance or the onset of a pest uh, late in the game. So there are stages in its development that uh, correspond to the uh, phenology of the pest that are not perceivable by the farmer. And that is where phenological models uh, do, in fact, uh, provide uh, important insight and foresight, allowing uh, farmers to be able to uh, know what to expect and to understand the stages that are hard to perceive. So phenological model uh, can be understood as a representation of certain cyclical changes uh, manifested by plant and animal life as a function of some environmental variables. We also must acknowledge that models are always uh, simplified uh, representations of reality or of life. So depending on our focus and our area of interest in a phytosanitary uh, situation, it really depends on the variables that we'll select, or that is dependent on the variables we will select to garner that representation. So what are some examples of phenological models? Uh, we've seen some very interesting ones in the past uh, presentations. If we speak about the estimation of the length of the development stages of an insect as a function of temperature, for example, the development model, uh, developmental degree days, for example, or model based on that. Or for plants, we can estimate the length of the development cycle of a plant as a function of temperature and its photo period. 
And we have examples of phenological models because let's remember, models can, are all different types. So for a long period of time now, we've used descriptive models in Mexico. Here is an example. This is a graph that uh, we can find in the uh, Central American Locust uh, Campaign. And it uh, presents a descriptive uh, model, a graph, uh, showing the times during the year when we expect the different uh, stages of development of the pest from January to April. De la segunda generación we have the adults from that period, the second generation to the prior cycle, and in uh, an area that is uh, ruptured in April. Y aparecen las nymphas There's, uh, copulates, oviposition, and the nymphs of the first generation appear. De mayo a mediados de agosto, y dan origen a los adultos de and la primera. It, uh, gives rise to the adults of the first generation of this year. Completan su desarrollo. Y, y, y they complete their development stage, and depending on the start date, uh, they have their oviposition between September and October. And then we have second generation nymphs, uh, the adults of the second generation as well. So this is a very general model that. Uh, experts use as a reference in order to uh, organize their surveillance or uh, forecasts of this past. We have more detailed uh, explanatory models, such as the one we just saw, and dynamic models as well. So what we do here is extract from the uh, real life system, the development cycle of the organism. And we look at the relationships uh, and uh, we input them in a mathematical model to represent the generations. And then we systematize the different changes based on environmental variables. The biological circles, uh, cycles sorry, are uh, characterized by days. But when we try to uh, reflect these cycles in a model, relationships are expressed uh, in temperature and rain, for example. So that way we can interpret uh, to what extent we can accelerate or delay the development of an organism uh, in a real life setting. Uh, based on the different temperature changes uh, and the models we've already uh, uh, talked about. So these models, as, as the previous speakers mentioned, they require different parameters that will make uh, the model more specific. So we have to see uh, how prolific these eggs, uh, these uh, females are, for example, uh, within a specific temperature and what's the length of time and what's the baseline uh, temperature or baseline developmental temperature. So we see that uh, nonlinear models are being adjusted. The classic one was uh, determining temperature based on a linear regression model. When the development uh, stage is zero and based on what temperature it is then. So as a result, we can uh, set parameters to these phenological models and input temperature and then uh, predict or estimate the phenological development of an insect. Now other models uh, similar to that uh, have locusts. They, they allow us to uh, attain variables uh, regarding the insect that will uh, reflect the different development stages uh, based on the environment and uh, other variables based on environmental factors, such as uh, ground humidity, for example, and the crop or the host itself. So we know in many uh, cases that uh, the development 
of the insect is really uh, conditional on the presence of a host. Diaphorina citrus, for example, as you're well aware, it's the vector of uh, Huang Long Bing of the, the citrus fruit. Although females, although females uh, may have been fertilized and may be carrying eggs, they won't uh, deposit or lay their eggs until there are new uh, there are new uh, plants uh, or new buds. So, so the development of the insect isn't only uh, dependent on the environment, but a specific feature or condition of the host here, the citrus fruit. So with regards to locusts, the uh, stimulus for this insect to, to rupture its, its uh, diapause during winter or during its hibernation period, it has to be based on favorable uh, soil humidity and growth of, of plants, especially pasture, that will uh, provoke this, this locus or stimulate it to uh, come out of its uh, hibernation stage, complete its uh, sexual maturation phase, and uh, finish its cycle. So as we can see, phenological models may be uh, very detailed, uh, as detailed as we would like, but we know that it's always a simplified look at reality. So the use of a model will be based on our including uh, the different uh, details and variables uh, that to a greater extent explain the development of the insect in the region that we where we want to calculate or estimate its growth. Now these models uh, uh, are an example of phytosanitary intelligence and they allow us to make predictions and issue uh, warnings or alerts to a well-known species throughout the continent, Podotra frutiferta, and we call it the army worm in Mexico. And it's uh, perhaps the most uh, important uh, maize pest, the most important crop in Mexico maize, that is. So you can see uh, it, the agricultural surface where maize is grown in Mexico, and we see uh, an estimation of the different uh, warning systems or warning periods uh, based on the phenological period and production. So in the coastal areas of the countries, in the uh, warmer areas, we have early onsets of the uh, warning or the alerts, and then in the more mountainous regions, the uh, later warnings, and that has to do with the temperature change. And I think we'll all agree that these models are truly useful uh, for purposes of phytosanitary intelligence, because they uh, will lead us to establish early warning systems and in each of the regions, we'll be aware of the most important points in time where we can set preventive actions against certain pests. Yet we believe that we can go uh, a bit further. Phytosanitary intelligence and early warning systems, phytosanitary warning systems uh, can be used uh, by uh, farmers and technical experts on site where uh, the crops are grown to help uh, users understand, uh, truly understand the phenology, not only of the past, but of the crop itself and how it relates to seasonality of, of environment, uh, to, to temperatures, uh, to seasons, and uh, at the different temperatures during the seasons. And uh, for the army worm, for example, when we emit information or issue information, not only a warning a system, and, and we uh, communicate the fact there are population groups of army worms, what the users want to know is What is the population dynamics of the pest and the host of the organism and the pest, sorry, organism and the host, 
and based on the uh, phenology. So let's look at the Guerrero uh, state. Uh, it's southern area of Mexico. It's uh, a red, an area that was in red in the previous in the previous map. It's here. It's right here in the coast, southern western coast. It's a very important uh, area or uh, very important uh, maize grower. And more than 450,000 hectares of maize are grown here in this region. Well, these hectares of maize uh, are based on different uh, seasons uh, during the rainy season, at the start of the rainy season. But 15% of the surface is uh, irrigated before the rain falls. So this leads to uh, our having a uh, evo an evolution of the surface surface of maize that we see here in this green curve. That's uh, uh, from the start of April, and the onset of the pest that remains in pasture if there's no maize present, and you can see that at the beginning of May. So when the crop his, has grown, or is growing rather, in the production areas, and the pest hasn't made its, uh, hasn't uh, appeared yet. Senesica issues a, a green light, like a traffic light, and that means there's a low risk or uh, hardly any risk at all. Although the crop is present, the pest has not yet developed. So uh, it's there's a low probability of its onset. Now, as maize grows and uh, armyworms start to uh, become detected, the limiting factor is temperature. When uh, temperature, but when the average temperature, when the average temperature exceeds uh, the temperature required for uh, the uh, pest to produce, then we, uh, this is first Spodoptera flohipera, and while we stay, remain in the first generation of the pest, uh, the bulletin that is issued by Sanasa will indicate, will show that the uh, alert is, is median, or it's a uh, middle, uh, it's not low, it's not high, it's at a medium stage. So, so most likely the pest will, will complete the generation on that crop. As we are well aware, and this is the relationship that we want to establish between the population dynamics and phenological development, when a pest completes a generation, the population uh, multiplies uh, given the fact that it's uh, prolific or its prolificity. So when we're just finishing the first or ending or completing the first generation, sorry, uh, from there and after, the risk uh, moves to a higher risk. So the early warning system or the warning system will move to high risk. And what do we uh, explain to the different uh, technical experts? And it's part of this benefit of better understanding of phenology based on the model. And, and using this better insight to explain it to uh, farmers and technicians. So when the pest is on a secondary uh, crop before the main crop appears, its capacity for reproduction is low. But once the crops are planted, uh, maize is planted in the region, and the insect will uh, move from its secondary uh, host to the main host, its reproductive capacity accelerates enormously. So users have to understand that we must uh, envision the development cycle by considering how the pest evolves, the population of the pest, that is, along with the host population and the phenological stages of the pest. So after the first generation, the following generations are uh, are definitely uh, definitely face high risk. 
So how do we explain this to farmers and uh, technicians? Well, during the first uh, crops, uh, the population of moths, for example, and, and uh, OV position on the parcel is low. And during the first few years, that is why we see that they are in uh, spots. But then when we plant during the season, the population group of that insect is hired and the capacity for infestation goes up. So as we can see in the prior graph, in the last few uh, crops, the farmer isn't dealing with uh, population from secondary uh, hosts and uh, stains or patches, or isolated stains or patches, but it's now dealing with uh, enormous populations of the insect with the capacity of completely infestating and ruining its crop. So for the first crops, uh, farmers can do what they generally do. They wait to see what the damage is. And uh, they, the, the farmer will interpret this as following. When he sees or she sees the first few holes on the leaves, uh, given the, the uh, activity of the armyworm, then he will uh, conduct, uh, or he, he will uh, respond, and he'll carry out a, a preventive measure. But it's no longer preventive because damage is done. But at this point in time, this is acceptable. But the later in in the crop stage, and uh, once uh, the pest lays eggs, the damage can be devastating. So what we try to explain is is that is what this concept of phenology entails, explaining how the environment and the development of the organism uh, play. Uh, how they interplay and the availability of the crop and what that interaction is. So the earlier the invasion of the crop by a larger number of, of insects, the greater the damage. So this is where we try to uh, apply phenological models uh, to to help farmers and producers understand uh, the phytosanitary principle that underpins uh, agroecological management, which is to prevent uh, damage by the organism on the crop. And so the farmer can understand that the objective is preventing the insect from completing a generation on the maize or on the crop. And what do phenological models uh, contribute? They contribute uh, the thermal requirements of the pest, its biology, and its habits. As we saw in detail in the past uh, presentations, and this helps us understand uh, how these insects, uh, how this insect acts, how it colonizes the crop and causes damage and monitoring in real time in phenological and uh, in, in different climate scenarios will help us define the biological windows that we have to act in for this objective to be uh, fulfilled, that the crop, sorry, that the pest not complete a generation on the crop. So here we're speaking about uh, polyphagous uh, pests such as armyworms. And if there are uh, that have more than uh, one generation uh, in a year, for univoltine uh, pests, such as uh, grasshoppers, that have a sim that uh, have a single generation a year, the last phase that we have to uh, do control or carry out control is during the last phase uh, at the nymph uh, three stage, which is uh, less mobile. And the preventive measure has to be uh, applied or carried out before it reaches its nymph three stage because it's more mobile and it's hard to uh, carry out effective control measures. 
So this is the perspective that we would like to uh, share with you. Phenological models uh, within different uh, phytosanitary intelligence uh, possibilities. Well, it's something we want to take uh, beyond, to, to go beyond with. We want to be able to help farmers uh, make a decision and help them decide how to act uh, despite the details and the uh, great databases we might have uh, within the phytosanitary intelligence realm, we'll never be able to under to include all of the different conditions available in a productive area. We can't represent all the different conditions. Uh, even if it's raining in, in the same area, uh, given the maize that's planted, given the date of planting and the type of soil and the type of, of agricultural management it receives, uh, variables uh, will differ. Uh, so early warning systems will be, are useful to be used as a reference point to be able to uh, activate uh, phytosanitary support teams. Yes. Let's remember that the last line of defense for the farmer, and for, uh, this is for the smaller farmers or larger farmers, they never know exactly how the crop, how the pest, if, if they don't know how uh, pests act, uh, we're going to continue to have to deal with pests that reproduce wildly and uh, try to control them in an untimely fashion. And we're going to end up using uh, indiscriminate use of, of pesticides, of chemical pesticides. So this is the focus that we want to uh, be able to, uh, to share with phenological models. And I just have some conclusions to share with you. Phytosanitary intelligence, first of all, is not responsible for pest control. It's the producer who's responsible. Thus, uh, we believe that these efforts, uh, these early warning systems and uh, phytosanitary intelligence should be aimed at helping technicians and producers to understand phytosanitary problems. Based on what? On the fact that phenological models allow us to visualize the different stages of pest development that are imperceptible to the grower, and they can be used as an educational tool for uh, producers to understand, uh, recognize climate, crop, and pest indicators that determine the need to apply phytosanitary measures. Uh, this is the information I wanted to share with you this afternoon, and thank you for your attention. Dr. Quijano, muy interesante, todos los planteamientos, e incluso parte de, de lo que presentó hoy día usted también es, sería muy interesante. Thank que... you very much for those for your presentations and part of what you've mentioned can also be shared in panel three, the early warning system panel, because it's the next step. So um, it can also be incorporated there, looking at different perspectives regarding early warning systems. And as I said before, we will have some time for questions at the end of this panel so that the rest of the panelists can participate and also others hearing us. And for my presentation, um, I will also focus a bit on early warning systems to go ahead and uh, make use of that opportunity since you've already mentioned it and we can also discuss the topic at the end. So thank you. Actually, yes, Roberto, in the early warning systems module, there will be a presentation by colleagues of mine at Senacica. They are the ones that produce our um, warning newsletters. Oh, great, that's wonderful. I have some questions, but as I said, we'll leave that for the last part so that we can keep up with that time. So thank you very much. And now I will share my screen.
¿Me pueden avisar si se visualiza? Please let me know if you can see the presentation. Yes, we do. Thank you. Entonces, eh, eh, partiendo con la presentación. Okay, eh, so the development of uh, phenological models, the case of Bagrata Hilaris for Chile. This presentation is related to a project from the uh, Institute of Agricultural and Livestock Development. With the participation of our agriculture and uh, livestock service from the part of the plant protection division and with a series of colleagues that work on phytosanitary intelligence as well. Here we see the members of the team, Dr. Pablo Gutierrez, I'm not sure if we have him still with us from University of O'Higgins. And he's also part of the FONDEF project team that we saw in the first presentation by Dr. Kurkovich. The counterpart for phytosanitary intelligence is myself. And we have an assistant researcher from the University of Chile, also under Dr. Kurkovich. Agricultural engineer Diego Arrastio, who is a PhD student, and the biological study team, project leader of uh, the project for Bagra Hilaris of our Institute for Agricultural Research, entomologist Nancy Vita, and counterpart for agricultural surveillance, Pamela Ibanez. So the objective is to share methodologies, results, and knowledge that we've acquired in the past years with a quarantine pest that we have. This presentation is part of our specific objectives of the integrated pest management for Bagrada y Laris under INEA Chile. This objective is developed by a team of professionals by different universities supporting the section of phytosanitary intelligence in SAG. And the results have helped us develop an initial prototype for a predictive model incorporated to our early warning system under our product producers portal, RPF. As we saw, by in the presentation by Dr. Thomas Perring. In the first years when we had this pest enter the country, we did this preliminary analysis of likelihood of establishment with Dr. Luis Morales from the University of Chile, who's also part of the team under Dr. Kirkovich. That was for 2018. The data we have used in the biological study for this analysis, data provided by INEA, such as life cycle tables obtained from bioclimactic chambers with constant temperatures of 17, 20, 25, 28, 30, 35, 38, and 40 degrees centigrade. Here, the idea is to have several measuring points for following work and adjustment of models. We also had uh, prospective data and survey data from the Metropolitan and Valparaiso regions. Data from SAG are different survey data in the Metropolitan region. Environmental data includes thermal yeah, information of sensors that we placed along the fields at different measuring points by our agriculture and weather system and data provided by SAG, thermal information from our weather stations and the full database available in the agrometeorological system of the RPF portal of SAG. Part of the methodology we used, the stages required to develop predictive models this is a combination of what we see in international information and our own experience 
having our own warning systems directed under a 90 by 90 meter grid that has automatic calculations. First, determining times and rates of development. Second, determining thermal parameters. Third, selection of upper and lower thermal thresholds. Fourth, establishing degree day models, accumulated degree day models for our early warning systems. Five, development of phenological models, comparing accumulated degree days and establishing phenological models in the SAD early warning system. Am I, are you following me? Yes. Yes, we hear you. Thank you. Um, a bit more on the methodology under determining times and rates of development. The determination of times and rates of development is done based on life cycle tables obtained by our research institute. For each temperature, there's a calculation of average time for the population or it takes the time it takes a population on average from one stage to the other. There may be differences um, with the project presented by Dr. Kirkovich. they follow the individual, not the population. We're looking at population. This was done between the uh, moment of laying eggs, nymph one, uh, laying eggs, nymph two, and also laying eggs to adult. Those were the periods we analyzed, looking at the life cycle tables. With that, we have what we've called development time. Uh, just in some bioclimatic chambers that we actually reach the adult level development. These chambers are a whole issue in and of themselves. Um, so anyone who has done this type of study understands what I mean. Uh, there's a lot of detail and much suffering uh, that researchers have to go through to ensure we can achieve our objectives. Point two of the methodology de determining the thermal parameters these uh, refer to the lower and upper thermal thresholds, what we've called UTI and UTS, and the cumulated, uh, cumulative degree days, GDA in Spanish. For that, we adjust the data using the linear model, but also nonlinear models. In this case, adjustments were done with nonlinear models of Breer, Contodimas, Performance 2, and Radkowski. The equations and parameters are in the table. So overall, the idea is that we have uh, tests for several models, even more than the ones we show on the table. The idea is to have a calculation of minimum and maximum temperatures directly, where other models end up being more complex and it doesn't allow us to have maximum and minimum temperature. So these were the ones that best fit. An advantage of nonlinear models that we've used is that all of them, the T min and T max uh, parameters explicitly appear in the equations. So both temperature parameters are directly obtained as a result of the adjustment of data. This gives them a comparative advantage compared to nonlinear models available in literature. The third temperature para parameter, degree days, cumulative degree days, do not appear directly from the adjustment of data, but they're calculated numerically. The procedure is conceptually similar to the one with a linear model inverse to the slope, and there's an average of local uh, slopes associated to the nonlinear model that was adjusted when they are positive. And then there's the inverse calculation of that value, and it gives us the degree day dimension. The selection of thermal thresholds or temperature minimum maximum requires a combined analysis. Once again, we look at the life cycle 
uh, tables, the adjustments of linear and nonlinear models, and field data. So we look at all the data um, that already was available. These come from monitoring at certain points selected by the INEA, and we record individuals of all immature and adult stages during the whole year in a cyclic manner. To select the uh, minimum maximum temperature, we calculate cumulative degree days for the days where we had uh, inspection or monitoring in our stations for the different lower uh, temperatures and different models that we used. That way, there's an evaluation of the relationship between the occurrence of population explosion or the beginning of a growth peak with the temperature accumulation starting on July 1st, the chronofix or the date where we start the uh, thermal accumulation in the Southern hemisphere. The fourth step is establishing the cumulative degree day model with our SAD early warning system. Once we have minimum and maximum temperatures in the cutoff method, we load the values in a panel for cumulative degree day models in our RPF producer portal. We see the image down here. And once we've uploaded those temperatures, which are here, calculation method, and you can select the continuous, which is the integral under the curve, and then minimum, maximum, base temperature, cutoff temperature, and cutoff method, whether horizontal or vertical. And we record, and so the system starts functioning. When we have that, there's the automatic processes happening in our spatial modeling modules. And this requires one to two weeks of calculation to come to the current date, starting on July 1st of the current season. The fifth stage is developing the phenological models according to the captures or the cumulative degree days. And this is uploaded to our platform or in our early warning systems. We have the tables with number of individuals collected versus date of the year and georeferencing of the monitoring station. What we see in the diagram is that the system creates for each georeferenced point the, the, the cumulative degree days according to the temperature that's logged in the system. So the good thing with the system and uh, with this code is that once you load the information, georeferenced information, which can be traps or monitoring points, the system then for each of these traps and the time series you require, it calculates the cumulative degree days for that point. And there it, loop, it, it uses all the information and uh, temperature data that the system has. And so it gives us a cumulative degree days versus captures. Once we have cumulative degree days and the catch data, we work with curves by adult peak or immature stages. The stages for the phenological model development are as follows. Calculation of cumulative degree days for the location of each trap in, during the period of study, creating databases with catch and degree days, analyzing the adjusted curves by generation, having models for adults and immature stages per generation, entering models to manage the table, selecting the percentage of eggs and length of generation that has to be controlled and the equivalent in cumulative degree days, entering values for cumulative degree days per immature stage and generation to program in order to create the warnings. The equations for flight modeling are logistic type with a following consideration. Because these are asymptotic curves, 
They don't have logical limits, limits on their extremes. Inferior tends to zero and superior tends to one. We take the start of the flight when values reach 3% and the end of flight when they reach 97%. To see the correlation of uh, flight percentage with cumulative degree days, we have the same formula, but uh, eliminating the cumulative degree days with the uh, having the correlation function, which may be linear, quadratic, or cubic. So establishing the phenological models in the early warning system, this last stage, is to finally load the parameters that we have obtained in our early warning system set. For that, administrators have to load the phenological models that we see down here per generation in a panel with a new model for pest administration or pest management, as we see in the image. So here they load the models and the cumulative degree days that give us a specific action per generation. For example, from the beginning, July 1st to the next control day, uh, degree days from the state to egg control or larva control, if they are lepidopterous, and if we have other types of bugs, they would be here with the nymph information and the phenological stage of pupae and end of control. As for the results, in the three periods where we obtained information from the moment of laying eggs to nymph one up to nymph two, and up to adult stage, we have these tables with development temperature and the time of development, rate of development, and temperature, and N. And then we did the adjustments of nonlinear models from egg laying to nymph two in this case. So here we see that. Nymph two with different temperatures and what the models give us, the adjustment for nonlinear and linear and results. Minimum temperature, linear model, Breer performance, Ratkowski and Contodimas. Maximum temperature, the same, and the uh, degree days associated to them. And for the main uh, adjustment of nonlinear models from the egg laying to adult stage, we work with different scenarios. We did not just run scenario one, which was to have direct results as we get them, but we had certain hypotheses as well. That's why we have more than one scenario in the analysis. In the figures, you can see the adjustment curves for linear and nonlinear models from the scenarios that are described. Scenario one seems to be more plausible as it has lower temperature thresholds. And the nonlinear models suggest three minimum temperature different models. The Ratkowski has a minimum temperature of 9.26. The adjustment or red curve here follows the majority of points appropriately. Performance model, performance two model, where the adjustment is not fully satisfactory, gives us a minimum temperature of 1449. Embryer is not so satisfactory either in this case, giving us a minimum temperature of 19.97. Upon seeing these results and considering the adjustments and uh, temperatures we had found, we thought we could test this out with field data, with the uh, temperature thresholds we had, just to verify whether the occurrence of the first populations 
had that type of thermal accumulation according to the thresholds we had. So here what we see is as we've mentioned before, Bagrata is cyclic, but it's found throughout the year. And starting on July 1st, which is here, around here, the first important peak of immature stages occurs about or around the 20th of August, as you see here. So we've marked the moment where we have a population growth of all phenological stages of the pest in the spring. Of the different scenarios suggested to determine adjustments and thermal parameters, while the maximum temperatures all agreed with the 40 degrees, the minimum temperatures differed, and they will also differ from what we had in the literature. The following table shows parameters obtained by scenario. And here we have the different scenarios in the columns, the different uh, temperatures. In yellow, the selected temperatures to test. In this other table here, we have average temperatures, the cumulative degree days using 16.7, I think that's 16.7, I think, and the cumulative degree days based on 1448. And lastly, 9.26, which is Ratkowski. And what we see, or what we saw in the analysis is that with the other temperature thresholds, when you have the peak over here, there's no thermal accumulation. But if we have 9.26, it does have that thermal accumulation, which confirms that at around that temperature, we would have the value we need. Now, to that, we have to add the observations and the experience on the field. Um, with the INEA, Nancy Vita, and others working on a project, and the experience by Pamela Ibanez's team in SAG, and what they have observed, individuals at quite low temperatures, which was what brought this all up in the first place. We had that question because internationally, it, supposedly the minimum temperature was 20 degrees, and we were seeing them appear at 11 degrees, 12 degrees um, with individuals in our environment. So, Because of that, we selected the adjusted Rutkowski model with the minimum temperature of 926 and the maximum temperature of 40 cumulative degree days of 396.3. Then as for the phenological uh, development of models, comparing uh, captured traps and cumulative degree days, the degree day model is an entry is entry data and it was determined by previous analyses using thermal chambers at different temperatures. For Bagrada Hilaris, the base temperature is 9.3 with a maximum temperature of 40 with a vertical cutoff. So that's what we saw in these curves over here. And this one, the red line is Ratkowski here and the vertical cutoff with that abrupt decline showing the highest temperatures. We used uh, data from the Colina station to associate degree days to the catch data. And in order to give greater clarity to the base information, the data on captures were grouped in two large groups, adults and nymphs, which uh, includes a total of nymph one to nymph five. And once we graph that, uh, comparing captures and uh, degree days, we have the graph. The nymphs are blue and the adult is orange. Um, 
development of phenological models, comparing captures and degree days. Degree days can be used as entry data based on the, I think it's similar to what we heard before, sorry. Um, to clarify base information, data of captures were grouped in the two groups. And now graphically, uh, we have the following curves or plots. So this is the information, this is the adjusted curve. It's taken to natural log logarithm, generation zero, generation one, generation two. It's quite tight and adjusted, but I think that we can see greater differences over here. And the equations obtained in the three flights or three generations are as follows. We can see first flight, second flight, third flight, and then the nymphs. So the, these flights refer to adults and then nymph generation one, generation two, and three. So those are the equations that are entered in the system. And the analysis of nonlinear models uh, and temperature parameters for the time of development between egg laying and NIF2, we had uh, development times and rates observed in other species. This is a development rate that slowly grows at low temperatures and then with optimal development temperatures and decreasing their rate at higher temperatures. This uh, behavior is well described by nonlinear models and it was the foundation for our adjustments in the report. The adjustment of data to nonlinear models was successful in some cases and not so much in others. Cases where we considered were most successful with adjustments were used to determine the temperature parameters in development. The selection of maximum, I'm sorry, a minimum temperatures was done with field data. We did not have many uh, data on monitoring stations and just one of them without chemical control. So this made it more difficult for our analysis and the results are not necessarily valid. The predictive model um, and as such, this study allows us to have an initial prototype, at least, of that predictive model at a local scale, because we still were missing many data to ensure the algorithms were robust enough. We could not really perform all the adjustments and determine all the temperature parameters in each phenological stage, and we did not have enough field information to validate and give a uh, greater scope to the geographical uh, validity of the model. Finally, in spite of all the inconveniences of working on this project of integrated pest management, we could find a good working strategy to develop the initial prototype of a predictive model. And that's a, a tangible result. This is what producers would see in the early warning system. These models that are loaded in the system start with uh, an establishment of a polygon at a certain variety area, and it follows pixel by pixel that area to uh, generate the cumulative degree day calculations and the percentages of progress in phenology. Pixel by pixel, it calculates the cumulative degree days. And once that is ready, it also runs the phenological model on top of that. And so it tells you the uh, progress percentage, for example, for egg laying, or for larvae of generation three, et cetera. And that's for the specific date when you open the uh, platform and uh, an eight day prediction. If we wanted to see this in population percentage, again, it's shown pixel by pixel. Here we have an orchard, a 
the polygon that's drawn over here is activated in this point of the map. And it shows you this uh, interface and you select how you wish to see the phenological stage of the pest. And down here, the same interface shows the progress considering cumulative degree days in that quadrant. So you have phenology maps and cumulative degree day maps that are used to support this site. So the producer enters the site every day and can see how it is advancing based on cumulative degree days. And at the eighth day, uh, there's the control time. The system lets them know you are at eight days for pest control. Please enter the system to program your chemical control because the system allows that. And it also lets uh, SAG know, it sends the notice to SAG where that chemical was uh, applied or where it's scheduled to. This is the RPF producers portal. And this is what producers would see when entering the system. They can see the agrometeorological system data. By default, it shows this tool, the 450 weather stations in the country that are uh, connected to the different regions in the Ministry of Agriculture. And this is the base information. They select the dates if they want to calculate a cumulative degree days, the temperature um, thresholds, um, and the kind of method. You can select uh, the full database data that fills in certain data or others to create a new database and calculate. And the calculation is uh, degree days for that day, the cumulative degree days, the day data, and according to the system, cumulative days and degree days. So all that information can be downloaded by producers. As Dr. Quijano mentioned, how important it is to provide information to producers and advisors. So this is the weather station tool, information of all variables per weather station with original or filled in data. And some parameters uh, and calculations that we'd like to add. We'd like to have uh, statistics of uh, frost or uh, heat shocks and others, we are still working on improving the data. And then agrometeorological information with the map. Initially, we had the meteorological stations, the weather stations, but now we have a new module. So let's see if you can uh, visualize this better. And uh, we can see the region. And we see the temperatures, the maximum temperatures. The minimum and the median. This is really important because uh, we're only uh, we're using the MODIS images to build this with the uh, information uh, climate from the meteorological station, and then we have a terrain elevation model. So. 
we can even use this for uh, purposes of projections on a regional pool. Since uh, Chile is so narrow, we can see that the uh, stretch uh, can be well visualized. So in the degree of days, uh, we can also calculate this information or the fiat degrees. So as the uh, season elapses, there is a potential transpiration of calculations in a area that's being studied in the central region of Chile. To view view. So these are passive remote sensing that do not uh, cross clouds. So with fewer clouds, uh, we have fewer areas with transpiration. Then if we move to the meteorological side, we see the meteorological station, 450 stations, and you can see the information on each of these points that uh, can be seen in the tools. And then the coverage areas where we see the calculation for alerts. Uh, and you can view it on a pixel to pixel basis. So we have three areas uh, for optimal modeling areas are marked. One goes from to zero to zero point five uh, Celsius degrees uh, with one day error, and then orange zero point zero five to zero point seven five, and then red zero point fifty five to uh, less. And what's optimal is to work in the green area, and that all of these areas would be green, but we're missing stations. And since stations have to, uh, well, they're a remunerator or something that we have to uh, pay for, then uh, it, it means that, that it's an expensive uh, tool to use uh, using the satellite information, uh, which is uh, free and it's daily. So when we input this with meteorological information and the model and the thermal maps that we have in that area, we obtain the results. There's a maximum temperature. There's a mix of the three types of data, and everything is 90 to 90 meters. So in a pixel, sorry, in a polygon, it's a quartile. Uh, and they're various uh, 90 by 90 meter pixels. It's not only one. And then we have the relative humidity uh, in this territory. The relative humidity that we developed uh, with the Visa Botrana project in the literature, uh, it was, uh, you can, it was determined that it affected the survival of the uh, eggs. So we developed this relative humidity model to see how we would include uh, this to a phenological model. And aggregate days for different species. Hilaris laris, which I presented. And uh, what uh, Dr. Kukovitz uh, presented. Lovisia Botrana, the model uh, developed in Chile for Lovisia Botrana. This is with the uh, reference information. Uh, so this information serves as input from the early warning system, which is here. The agrometeorological system. Uh, the one that uh, is below this, and it's for farmers. So we see a panel for uh, phytosanitary warning and oversight or control, and then uh, we see a map, a phenological map for pests, and sending uh, warning out for uh, application purposes. And then here's where the hosts are entered for the different species the varieties of the species, the phenology, 
associated pests. La de las plagas, and a pest phenology. Puelo agraria. That's the Los de plagas, and the different models for pests that we have. The, they're loaded. And the uh, tenth degree. And and these are the uh, different ranges of uh, of days and the different phenological models that are loaded based on uh, phenological status of the pest and generation. And then we see the uh, tables. We see the uh, ratio of days to the phenological status. And here we see the phytosanitary information. Red, when it's green, it means that the pest is active. Uh, red means that it's in the, uh, sorry, orange, it means uh, egg control, uh, control of uh, eggs and larvae in red, and control of larvae and uh, nympha in blue, or inactive white or gray. And each of these represents a polygon that corresponds to a quarta where the farmer uh, uh, is represented by a polygon. So the Bicia Bertrana here, which I had explained, and we see uh, Prila Aralia and Bagrata Ilaris. And it says that it's 95% are in an adult uh, generation two phase, 89% of nymphs, second generation, and GDA, 1,497, eight days. So the farmer will uh, look at this information uh, in a more in more detail, and the idea is for uh, farmers to understand what each each uh, row means or each column means. And if they look at uh, forecasts for chemical control, inicial. Uh, they have to select an initial uh, pesticide farmers that they're going to use for chemical control. So the system based on this pesticide will uh, provide the results, the following results. It's the uh, number of applications based on length in days. So the intrepid, for example, uh, lasts 18 days. And these are the days left to be completed. So you can change this, uh, the chemical control for each application. For Lubisa Botrana, uh, you enter the uh, sites that are authorized in the new system. And then here you see the pesticides where they load. So this is for the Bicia Botrana. There are some for uh, other pests. We see the pesticide for Perilia Aurelia, which was uh, a research by Dr. Kurtzovitz. Then we have, uh, so the pesticides uh, control group will give their approval for us to post that, uh, the pesticide uh, user association. And the same is being done with Samele uh, Bañas, who is uh, now working on uh, uploading the information for another pest, another important pest to Chile. And, uh, Pest phenology. Here's the pixel to pixel map where the models, the phenological models work. 
Esa población, por ejemplo, presencia. Population presence. Generación. Generation. Y control. Control. Lo mismo para proveedoría agraria. Eh, está The same goes for proveedoría agraria. Eh, voy a sacar los hijos para que no se me borre la guía. Eso. Para que ver solamente el mapa. That way you can see the map only. Entonces, como podemos ver, eh, eh, esa información de los, digamos, de la fenología, de los modelos fenológicos. And the information uh, about the phenological models activate a different responses. So on the one hand, the forecast uh, up to eight days, the warning uh, when uh, it fit for control of larvae, control of eggs or nymphae. Uh, eight days later, it'll give you a warning for each of the remaining days uh, with regards to chemical control. And it, uh, and it generates these maps showing presence control or control. Lo interesante también es que te puede servir más adelante para... But they can also be useful uh, later on. Cuando tú tienes todas estas herramientas de, de control fitosanitario. For example, if you have your uh, pesticide, all of your different uh, phytosanitary control methods, uh, sexual control, or to sterilize uh, the pests, in order to understand uh, how to attack the pest, uh, you would or you would use these dynamic maps that are activated day to day to understand how to control this pest or these pests and they're updated daily in the system. Okay, so that's all I have for you today. And uh, hopefully I was able to explain in detail uh, Chile's early warning system. I'm not sure if you can all attend the next uh, panel, but at least we're able to provide plenty of information during this panel. So this is just uh, what we're working on right now. And I am definitely open to your questions at the end of the session. Thank you. Entonces, yo no sé si hay pregunta, consulta. Are there any questions? We're moving on to the question and answer session. Yo tengo algunas preguntas que, que estoy viendo. Some eh, questions that I'm seeing in the chat box. En el chat, en el de panel. Entonces, and it's from the panel. The a, a, so a, let's uh, notice, how about if you if we answer the chat questions, or if we go with the social, uh, or with the panelist questions, or, uh, or you decide whatever it seems, uh, whatever seems to you to uh, work well. well. What we could do is also look at the social media and see what other questions have been asked. Okay, would you like to do that? Or should I be in charge of the questions? You, you go ahead, you go ahead. You're the moderator, go ahead. Okay, so uh, let's see. I see questions for Dr. Korkovich. It's from Maricela Javar. It says, have you planned or have you already executed uh, at a field level, a field level response to issue a warning system and to uh, apply some sort of integrated management? Bueno, eso es lo que quisiéramos y hacia donde apunta. Yes, that's the goal. That's what we would like to to attain, and that's what this research has to do with. Uh, that's how it, what it relates to. Fundamenta el desarrollo de los sistemas de alerta temprana, pero claramente. It justifies using uh, early warning systems, but at least uh, for the project that we're working on, uh, since given the results, we are. Uh, we're undergoing a, a stage where we're just uh, starting up the project. There are some aspects of the phenological model itself 
that we still need to, to pinpoint or understand, rather, then uh, once we consider it to be robust enough, we have a second uh, requirement, which is how to provide, how to support these forecasts with recommendations, tangible recommendations, that is, for solutions, uh, for different types of solutions. We mentioned Lubisa Botrana, combining uh, modeling, forecast modeling, uh, warnings or alerts, and, and uh, its, its function. But we have to understand that this has to go hand in hand with uh, robust information uh, with regards to the different management uh, possibilities. For La Vice Batrana in Chile, as Roberto mentioned, uh, there was tremendous development in Chile uh, in the in academia and industry to establish different uh, protection parameters provided by the uh, different options, uh, chemical control that is. And that is, is literally a project in itself. So if we understand that the different species uh, will eventually respond differently to uh, the different uh, management strategies and, and pests, this requires uh, more research that will uh, support uh, phenological studies to make uh, pertinent uh, recommendations, uh, precise ones. So we would have to uh, see case by case how each solution works. And in some species, such as Begrada or um, Auralia in Chile, it hasn't been uh, developed enough for Spencer Botana. It, it, it did, uh, because Chile invested in research for that species given its its uh, scope, which is much broader than many of the other species we've looked at. So at the end, we were able to get uh, robust information, or at least with, with some level of development to make recommendations. Right now, someone asks me, I really I'm not sure as to how to make recommendations before conducting this type of, of study as to how different pesticides work or alternatives available for, for pest management. We haven't uh, done that yet. There is a initial effort being made right now to uh, consult agrochemical companies and uh, see if they're interested in developing this type of research or Ask them if they have information that is trustworthy data uh, that is scientific, uh, based on scientific uh, concrete uh, results. So from that standpoint, uh, we still have more work to do on that. Right now, we have the objective or the endpoint of developing our early warning system and the phenological model. But yes, that's a later stage. We do have to uh, develop that other information to broaden the, the tool for the early warning system, not only saying when the problems are, but perhaps uh, also giving advice as to how the farmers or how farmers can, can resolve their issues and face the problem. I do agree with you, uh, all of us that work with Lobisi Botana, uh, that worked with that late beforehand to develop uh, control systems or oversight systems uh, for the sterilized insects uh, in national and, and international projects that provided support. The efficacy of chemical uh, products as well, the application of pheromones, for example, and bio biological control. And, and the idea uh, is that this is open to different control methods. And when you load the information on the tables, you would hope to uh, obtain information uh, that will allow us to control the different phenological uh, stages with different strategies, uh, be they pesticide or biological controls. But having the information in place for that, for Lubisia Botrana, we worked on pupa models because there was a national uh, pesticide that had a, 
uh, chemical pathogen that the agricultural uh, institution uh, institute developed. So we worked on pupa models because it was the, the stage that was most uh, controllable. This, so So that's that's for Luisa Bertrana. But yes, we should have the goal for different of, of having different alternatives. Okay, thank you, uh, Thomas Lab, for your response. Okay, the next question. It's for oh, pardon me. Roberto. Uh, Dr. Pering wants to comment if if you I I, I have a question, uh, Roberto. Your your um, your forecasting models are very, very, um, they're very complex. And clearly there's a huge, huge research effort that's gone into that and I applaud you for that. One of the things I remember from my visit, especially with the Bagrata situation is that many of the farmers are fairly small farmers with coal crops and broccoli and and my question is, do you have any data about the how many farmers actually use these kinds of models? And is it is it accessible to them? Second. Sorry. Uh, well, Dr. Tap is muted. <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay. The two new uh, early warning systems that are loaded are for, uh, he mentioned the, the pests, and they both have been lo were loaded uh, January and February uh, 2021. So we're going we're we're going to move on to a stage, a dissemination stage, let's say, and and a training stage uh, for different types of, of farmers to teach them how to use this program for Perelia and Bagra de Laris. For Lubisi Batrana, well, there are more farmers that, that need that information. The difference is that Lubisi Batrana is uh, has an early warning system that's a uh, uh, middle type uh, system that has different types of phenological modeling uh, to provide warning warnings per so, per areas per regions because it was hard for many farmers to access the system given the fact that there was so much information available uh, there were models that seemed to be too scientific for them so since uh, the idea was uh, to have two types of systems uh, a more uh, user-friendly uh, system early warning system and another one for uh, scientists or for individuals that are more have more of a know-how and that wanted more details about monitoring so they were adapted to to the uh, different users and, uh, that's how we combined the information so right now we have to start to train farmers in using this it's cross-cutting multidisciplinary for farmers to medium to larger size farmers a uh, farmer uh, smaller farmers are uh, addressed with uh, municipal levels or city level uh, technicians that go out and show them how to use the information so training is is carried out so that's my response nice Thank nice you, that, that's that's um really good and so and it just you know you just started with them so i think that's really good i have one one more question is one of the things I noticed in your Bagrata model is a lower development threshold of nine degrees, if I understood. Yeah. Which is much lower than what we determined, much lower than what some other laboratories. My question is, with a low threshold like that, you grow the population faster at lower temperatures, right? So my question is, is there a risk of having farmers 
use pesticides when they don't really need to if that threshold is set too low. Ya, yeah, I think it's for, it's for that. Uh, 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 that is why, um, yes, you're, you're right. So that is why when we define the result of the model, we speak about an initial prototype of a predictive model uh, that then is, uh, that that is uh, delimited to a specific area or it's specified or defined for a specific area because we can't consider it. It's easier to do that than, than thinking that it's a model for a national level. We don't have enough information for uh, farmers at national level. So farmers in the Northern area, the metropolitan area will have information for them. And then another area closer to the uh, fifth region will, will try out the model with them. But stating that this is the start of a process where, uh, which is part of a project uh, for pest control. Uh, remember, there were fewer resources, very few resources assigned for developing a model. So that is why we delimited the information, uh, as I mentioned beforehand. But we were able to devise a strategy to be able to uh, have a, an initial uh, deliverable and then scale it up yeah. and then and then we had funds that were able to be uh, competitive funds uh, that we used for that uh, we had to scale it up to a uh, prototype one or two a uh, prototype uh, and then uh, increase that or grow that until we uh, have a robust a group that will consider uh, all areas where the pest is. So that's the idea for scaling this up. And yeah, we're gonna test it out first in areas where we have the most data available. Uh, we're not saying that it's ready for everybody to use because that's not the case. It's, it's a starting point. That's great, that's beautiful. So well done. <laughs> Gracias. Toma. Seguimos con la siguiente pregunta. Thanks. Eh, next question. Aldo León Avila is saying, uh, good afternoon. I'm very thankful for uh, taking part in this uh, webinar. I have a question for Juan Quijano. How can you predict the spread of Diaphorina citri if the insect itself requires human beings to spread? I'm not sure uh, if, if that's the case. Dr. Guijano, perhaps you can shed more light on, on this comment about how Diaphorina uh, citri spreads. Bueno, eh, al igual que, que plagas similares a, a este. As, es un... as similar to Diaphorina citri, the type of pest. There is a population of, of these pests in the areas that are uh, surrounding areas of crops or of gardens and that, uh, that invade the crop from secondary plants. When the seasons of, of a cycle uh, favors uh, the, the issuance of, of new buds, or of new, sorry, of, of new uh, out, outbreaks. So more pests outbreaks during the summer when they're more, there's more favorable weather for the host, which is the citrus, uh, to show uh, the condition that triggers, uh, or no, not, not outbreak, shoots, where, where it uh, grows shoots, which, which triggers the pest. So, they sit in the secondary plants uh, around the, the garden or within the garden, and they're in a uh, low activity phase and are triggered, uh, their, their breeding process is triggered and the invasion of the citrus plant starts. So how do they invade new areas? Well, there are different hypotheses. Uh, the wind will, will 
Syrians. We'll eh, move or, or relocate these uh, Syrians and uh, poor management of, of uh, plants in the greenhouses also leads to the uh, transfer of, of, of these pests to other gardens. It's a pest that is uh, very prevalent in citrus gardens. But as is the case in different crops, or in all crops, most pests uh, don't end. Uh, there's uh, this uh, idea that farmers think that, that uh, there's a quick onset of phytosanitary issues. Uh, they, there's an outbreak, and we call them ep epidemiological outbreaks. But this doesn't come out of nowhere. It's a process that is slowly developing. The fact that we do not see adults or immature pests of, doesn't mean that it's not present. Many times we send our experts out, they say, can't see anything, and they report zero in their, in their reports, their briefs. Two months later, there's an epidemiological outbreak out of control. So there are different phases for phenological uh, development that uh, occur without uh, the human eye being able to perceive it. And that's where models play an important role. And all we need, uh, so, so the tests are there, they just need the right conditions to uh, be triggered. Also, the greatest spread pest spreader are crops. In secondary uh, plants or crops, they have a limited capacity to reproduce and spread. Once we they spread through uh, planted crops that are planted in great extensions with favorable conditions for reproduction of and spread of these pests. Sí, sí, sí. ¿Hay algún tipo de modelamiento de and do you have any type of models that you're using for that? Yes, of course. I remember when there was a very active campaign against the HLV in the whole continent, really. There were many attempts, and, and we have very interesting examples of high split modeling with the particle dispersion models that try to explain how the vector came with the HLV to the peninsula in our case. In Mexico, it was first detected in the Yucatan Peninsula. And there's uh, explanations there based on hurricanes and weather events, um, large-scale weather events that quite likely moved populations of these insects. And so there's also um, analyses, uh, schemes of just uh, tourist flows or normal flows uh, of a product exchange between countries that try to explain this. And of course, each has one part of the truth. So those are anthropogenic dispersion models. Yes. Just to let you know that in, in the context of this activity, this is a project by Procisura Naica, and it's precisely for HLV. We have several initiatives there, so we'd love to keep in contact to discuss these matters with you and uh, keep progressing with the uh, knowledge you have. So thank you. We will we will keep in touch with you as well. Thank you. Very interesting. Dr. Kirkovich had uh, some questions. Go ahead, Thomas Love. Yes, I had my hand raised. <laughs> and, and it's really more comments uh, that I wanted to add to uh, what we've heard from our colleagues and the questions that have been asked. I tried to write some things down because I tend to forget things at this time of day. 
I wanted to say something regarding the tool, a very important tool for phenological modeling, which is using nonlinear models. Mm, precisely because of this kind of discrepancy that we find in the Bagrata case, where you see very different uh, values depending on the model you use and very different from what we saw uh, by Dr. Perring. And so in that sense, what we've done is that when we use a series of different mathematical models to adjust the information we find in the lab. We did a study on how to select the best. Again, there's a countless number of statistics to consider and we actually ranked the statistics to help us decide because with many of these models, they're quite similar. Uh, one to the other, and you, you can see similarities. Um, so you might select them based on minor aspects, if we look at it quantitatively. But what I'm trying to say is that we need to have some kind of a criterion, probably quantitative, to select the best models. And from that, to derive the uh, parameters we are looking for. But we cannot forget either that uh, the reality is that these models might provide uh, some information that may seem reliable, but uh, when we go to real life, they don't necessarily apply. And that's a question we've asked ourselves uh, over and over in our work. And uh, it has just come up after these presentations too because of the variability we see with the Begrada studies. So uh, to sum up, we need quantitative criteria to select the model that gives us the best information without forgetting uh, a realistic viewpoint. Uh, that maybe a model might work perfectly statistically speaking, it is not necessarily true to reality and it differs from what we see on the field. So we have to work with both those. Yes, can I comment something there before? Let, let me finish first, let me finish, sorry. Just to be sure that I get everything in. In a comment for Dr. Perring, I wanted to know what you think regarding the work on Bagra, because when we worked with Proelia with a great effort as well, a lab work, we tried to identify the temperature parameters by stage. In Proelia auraria, that's probably very important because of the heterogeneity in populations in the field. So that was clear for us, but I think that in the case of Bagrat, I'm not sure. Uh, it could be why we see these deviations in the information uh, from one or another origin. The fact that if you group several stages and you do the estimates for several stages, you might lose some information. Eventually the weight of one stage or one threshold that's more general for one species, it could be very different. Some stages are longer than others. And so if you're working with averages or, or putting them together in groups, you don't necessarily have the relative weight of each. So there might be a potential error there. Uh, what would you say? Dr. Pering to that. What feeling do you have in this sense? Because I understand that your work is based on each of the different stages, quite similar to what we did in our project. Those were my comments, thank you. And well, it was a question actually, thank you. I'll, I'll make a, a, thank you. a quick stab at it. I mean, you are correct, uh, Thomas Love, that there are um, various indices, the Kiki, Criterion index is one good one to take a look at these adjusted R squares. You can you can look at the uh, um, residual variability on these different models. I think it's good to try as many as you can. Mm -hmm. I also uh, we also know that data that are generated with 
uh, environmental chambers set at constant temperatures do not represent yeah. the real world. And uh, they're they're good they're good for making models. And let's just remember, models are models. They are representations of the real world. So I do value. Um, those are two comments I would make. There are ways to look at all these different, certainly nonlinear models and to determine which ones are the best. And then uh, even relating it back to what the, what your, uh, what your laboratory data tell you. I mean, we, we did studies at 20 degrees constant and there was no survival. The eggs never hatched. So, you know, then we, then so you don't want to go too much below that with your lower developmental threshold that's predicted by the linear regression. So everything that we, I think we all understand this and that, you know, variable data, sometimes in the field, you could go out in the field and have a, a nine degree temperature and find if it's, you have a warm day the next day, you could find live Budrata. Well, they didn't all die when it was nine degrees, clearly. So. I think I think the, I, I did like very much um, Roberto's uh, project looking at real live data in the field compared to the vis a vis the, the data from the laboratory. So, um, yeah, models, we just need to take them with a grain of salt. And the more complicated they are, probably the better they will predict and the more difficult they are to use. <laughs> So that's the kind of the continuum of models. You know, I'm not a modeler, I'm an IPM specialist, but that's my experience with modeling. And uh, I'm, I'm really impressed at, at what, um, you know, what Roberto, you, what you presented. Um, and uh, so that's, that's my comments. Yeah, I, I would like to do a little comment. Uh... Well, eh, it's true that eh, es verdad lo que el profesor eh, Kulkovich, eh, digamos. Eh, it's true that, uh, as Dr. Kulkovich said, the ideal project would be one where, for each phenological stage, you could determine your temperature parameters and to be able to assess all the information and to see which one best adjust to this. In our case, it was not uh, a modeling project. We were looking at integrated pest management. Um, and one of the specific objectives was to develop models, but really we can't tell them you don't do that, don't include it, right? It's not that we don't want to, but we're not sure, you know, but having a good model to add to an early warning system, we need many data and good data because it's a, like a chain of calculations and a chain of errors. So if you look at each part of your calculations that you need to get to the alert, you have to ensure you do the best at each of these parts with as many data as you can with several scenarios tested, uh, with data from weather stations, calibrated stations that come in on time. Uh, it's uh, a lot of information, environmental, biological, uh, to work together and give an alert that would be ideal. But when we have integrated pest management projects that cover all integrated management of the pest, having all that information is impossible. So because we're asked to support them with that, we tried to find a strategy to ensure that we could have at least an initial prototype, as we called it, which can later help us scale it to a specific modeling project where we can have the data we need uh, for a project such as the one by uh, Dr. Kirkovich, where they use the Loesia Utrana uh, models and so we started looking at them and learning from them to see what critical points we needed to pay attention to, to ensure we had good models. Mm -hmm. So what we saw from Dr. Krukovic's project is that there's a lot of experience they've already gained. 
that comes together into a system that gives us such great information, like the early warning system and model development and uh, looking at what is happening with nonlinear models elsewhere. And that was all included in the Proelia Auraria project. So that not just entomologists and their team would work, but to have an interdisciplinary team. And we saw Dr. Krukovic's presentation. Many of them are here with us. Some are physicists, mathematicians, environmental engineers, entomologists, and others, PhD students and others. So we supported them as much as we could to ensure we had a, a practical side as well, which is what we have to do. So it is a lot of work. Uh, with Dr. Krukovic and his team, we've spent weeks and weeks uh, on reports, and um, we are more or less satisfied that at least we're doing as much as we can. Yeah. I would also, um, just, just to, to follow, I think it's great. I think the, the projects are great that early warning systems are fantastic if they give us nothing more than say, okay, this is an area that we should that you're warned about, it's time to go sample. You know, it, it's, uh, integrated pest management is based upon sampling. You need to know when to pull triggers for various biological control aspects, various chemical control aspects, cultural control aspects. Um, so early warning can say, okay, this area based upon this whole bunch of variables is an area that we would expect that now you are warned and you know uh thomas Lopp, if you have a if you have a good a pheromone trap that's telling you when you start running your day degree model so that then you can time your insecticides and that's kind of the basic way that that you would use those degree day models but even if if, if, the, if the early warning gives us nothing more than says okay here's an area that We've never seen it before. Now we're predicting that it's going to be there, so it's time to be on your alert. Your alert, or if you're a farmer, it's time to go sample your field, because every field condition and every situation is going to be unique in itself too. So, yeah. I think it all goes. It, they're just great tools that we use. Again, if nothing more, to say it's time to go out and time to go out and look in your field and see what's around your field. Yeah, yeah. You say, you say. It's true. In the case of Lovesia Botrana, we've been able to follow up on how these models work. When Lovesia Botrana arrived in Chile with the historical host crops, we just thought of plums and grapevines where we saw the main attacks, but it changed in Chile and it started attacking blueberries. So when attacking blueberries, you had something quite interesting come up because the first generation model is something we used to give a warning and we told producers they had to wait for plant phenology to start controlling. thinking that the main crops would be grape vines or vines that produce wine grapes, the model was probably delayed for several days, but producers had to wait for a certain phenological time. And when it came in and started attacking blueberries, then there was a direct prediction on a crop that was vulnerable to be attacked. So for that first generation model, sorry, I, everything went black here on my side, sorry. So for that uh, phenological model of the first generation, uh, they said, well, the important thing was uh, plant phenology, but then it happened that the pest changed in Chile and it started attacking other species that was ready to be attacked with fruits before that. So the model that was not very well adjusted to uh, our grapes was well adjusted to blueberries. 
So in any case, it's interesting how you learn as you go and what pests make us learn, trying to keep up with uh, the best way to control them. And as Dr. Quijano said, a pest control is a multi-factor issue. What we try to cover is just one part of all the requirements to control it, which is the right time yeah, to anticipate that right time to act. But if producers calibrate their equipment well, and if they use good products and apply them as they should, that is part of the producer's responsibility, right? We just support uh, the strategy we have. Today we have, or we're preparing a regulation for our advisors in the early warning system so that uh, government teams uh, and others that are supporting producers uh, can all be trained to use the system to support producers. So that's our stage now to ensure that we cover the territory as best we can. I'm sorry, Roberto, sorry to interrupt. It's been a really interesting exchange. But unfortunately, we don't have much time left and there's questions from participants that are still pending. So if we could please look at the questions of, from participants, sure. Hector Emilio Medina says, good afternoon and greetings to all in the panel. Congratulations to Dr. Quijano for his presentation. And I'm wondering about his phenological model for Central American locusts. Do you have a paper on the mathematical model that you showed? And what is the process of validating models in the field? How can we know when a model can be satisfactorily adjusted. Hector Medina's question. Experto Hector Medina Argentina. is an expert in Argentina and he's in charge of uh, warning systems in his country. And Les, um, el panel, digamos, the panel with the European community. Gracias. Thank you. There is a paper published in uh, 2013, I believe. I don't remember the journal. I'm a co-author, and I'm sorry, I don't remember the journal. But uh, it's a paper on the locust model, the mathematical model. We have it, and we've continued working on it. And... Uh, that is a great question because it helps me also tell you that dynamic models, that's a dynamic model. So it wants to estimate not just phenology, but also the population dynamics of the insect. It includes soil variables and host crop uh, variables in the pastures. In dynamic models, it's not like when you have controlled experiments and you compare uh, the estimate with what you've observed. The experimental approach helps us control many variables, but only analyze those two I'm interested in. So when you have... Uh, square areas of 0.98 is quite satisfactory, but that only happens in very particular situations. The development and growth of a pest in a specific area, as Roberto said, is a process that has multiple factors. The more you can do with dynamic modeling is uh, hope that trends match. So, when the monitoring campaign on the field detects peaks, uh, population peaks, then the model 
should uh, follow that. So I can't expect to have 98% of correlation between the estimated population and what the technician has estimated because not mine or the technicians, neither will be uh, right or accurate. I mean, we don't know the real value. So the m most we can expect is that from that process where I'm taking pictures and samples, the model can help me reproduce trends. If I can reproduce trends, then I can make decisions. For dynamic models that are so complex, that's what you try to look for, not necessarily uh, R square 0.98. I hope I answered the question. And in any case, the model is available for anyone uh, who is interested. Yes, Hector Medina. Thank you. It's built on a platform. It's called the Benzin simulation window. And it's available to share, of course. I'll also look for the paper and uh, make it available. Thank you. That's precisely one of the topics we were interested in uh, with these panels, having several experts participating and uh, seeing also how to model this later on with locusts uh, to see what you're doing. In other panels, we'll have experts that are, uh, work on these topics to build a network of specialists. Uh, we have different visions, and so we can certainly contribute to each other's work. And I forgot just one thing. The model simulates growth of a population in one specific area. So the model does not simulate the dispersion of the pest. It does simulate growth in one specific area. So obviously, if we want to follow up on uh, locust play pests and, and see how they disperse, we need more than a model. We need a series of complementary data to see if they will stay there or if they will move. Uh, so there I recommend the approach by FAO in the locust dispersal system. They combine satellite analysis, uh, field sampling, and other models. So they test out different hypotheses, whether they will remain on the site, if they will migrate. And also to say that um, what we heard before, uh, whether the model is precise enough, and if I'm wondering uh, whether it will actually help me represent uh, a situation that is real for producers, as we also heard from Dr. Pering, each producer has their own conditions. So in a complex system as the one we saw from Roberto, something important is that the producer themselves can add information to see how to better calculate, because you might be estimating in a whole region the phenomenology of the pest, but the biofix, the biofix can be different for each producer, right? So even if you have a very precise model, uh, the prediction might not really work for that producer. Yes, thinking about uh, what you're saying, uh, Dr. Quijano, I also mentioned a program of uh, authorized advisors these are phytopathologists, entomologists, or companies that monitor. And uh, when we were pilot testing these first models, we had these companies come in. They didn't say they were companies. Uh, and they started using the system to see when they had to go to the field beforehand to monitor. So because the system would say um, in eight days, you'll have 3% eggs, they planned their visits based on that. And we didn't even know they were doing this. Um, but then of course, after a year, they would tell us, hey, I'm using your model to see when I should go monitor and it's working fine. So we got that idea and said, well, maybe we could train them 
since they're already using it, we can help them understand the field data, load more data for us and uh, help us more. And then their producers will have better service as well because they'll have people on the field monitoring. Sorry, Roberto. I, I don't want to be rude, but for technical reasons, we have to close and we still have some questions. If we can finish up. Yes, we do have a very good question by Pamela Ibanez. How do you visualize data incorporation for microclimates at the soil level to have a warning system for pests, uh, contemplating some of their stages, uh, looking at locusts or bagrada or fruit flies? and uh, how to approach gregarious pests in the period where you have an overlap of generations. So that question. And that is for all panelists. In general. In general. Does anyone want to comment on this? Someone who's experienced in uh, considering the, the environmental conditions of the uh, ground to include that in a phenological model. It's an interesting topic. It has to do with pests, locusts that have a cycle on, on the ground or food fries or belgrata. So if any of you have experience in that as to how include uh, this to the models. Uh, yes, it's possible, and there are examples. But it's all experimental. I could focus on, on, on sensors or, or areas to, to measure more the climate more precisely and meteorological conditions in the uh, corresponding microclimate. We've done that to adjust the different uh, parameters, favorable conditions for uh, leaf and, uh, and outbreak or uh, fluorescence in crucifers. We can't use relative, humid, uh, relative humidity that, that determines uh, a season and that doesn't reflect the microclimate of that area. So with sensors, we've been able to make uh, adjustments. If the uh, station has 60% uh, relative humidity, then I have 80. Uh, so the requirement uh, for the fungi or the bacteria is met. So I consider that it's uh, possible the disease. So we've done that. But to generalize this use, uh, the idea is to, there's phenological stage where the uh, crop covers the ground and has its own relative humidity. And, and what's essential here is to understand, to be able to set parameters uh, how, to how much the relative humidity goes up uh, and match that to the phenological stage. And the same uh, goes with, with, with fungal pests. For uh, locusts and other pests, there are models that estimate uh, at different uh, soil depths, but we'd have to determine for, for different types of soil uh, how the temperature varies uh, based on the density. I haven't seen models that include this or that make predictions uh, in, in large extensions or large surfaces. That's still something that needs to be studied. We're very interested in that area especially because today uh, there is a lot of data, uh, satellite data that allow us to uh, measure large extensions and, and we can obtain some sort of model to uh, model the temperature. We're not uh, too far from, from having something like that. We should be able to speak about that. Uh, let's speak about that someday, doctor, to see if we can make some headway in that research. I, I think that's a it's a great question. Excelente pregunta. That's a great question, and, and oh. if you if you consider the biology of Bagrata, for example, they lay their eggs in the soil. So as an early warning, 
if you had if your temperature um, weather stations have soil probes, I, I assume yours do. Ours do in our country, and so that could be an addition to at least the early part. And and Thomas Love, you were talking about modeling the different life stages. Those eggs have to grow in the soil to to reach the first generation nymphs that are going to form infested the field. So early season monitoring of soil temperatures makes a lot of sense. Mm. So I think it's a great question. It's something that could be added to to your guys' early warning. Talking about early warning, that's that could be a real key. That's mm. really a great question. Excellent. Great. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you very much. Queda una sola pregunta que es dirigida a mí. Eh, básicamente. There's, simple, there's one more question that says, Dr. Tapia, what actions have been done for farmers to be able to interpret Chile's system and what mechanisms do you have to disclose this information? We have a training program and we it's a training program uh, that takes place once a year and it uh, has to train a specific number of farmers. So before the pandemic, I would go out uh, at one point during the year, region by region to train the different farmers. And this was done uh, with the Fruit Growers Association, with the uh, the Wine Growers Association, sorry, with the Wine Producers Association of Chile. So we worked with these uh, associations to be able to meet the producers in one site uh, where we could go out and uh, do face-to-face -face meetings. Or we would also hold meetings at uh, regional universities. And that's our outreach or extension program. It was uh, exhausting, really. Uh, and now we have more support for that purpose. It's uh, hard to, to find a good internet, a, a, a place where we can all meet on site. So, so we also attended different meetings, uh, agricultural fairs, and uh, it's all word of mouth. So it's a great pleasure to have uh, been participating here with you, uh, Tomas, Dr. Quijano, Tomislav, uh, all of you. Thank you so much for your uh, knowledge for uh, this panel has definitely uh, been motivational in, in thinking about what we can do uh, to uh, to improve, to uh, enhance our methods for phenological studies in the modeling in the future. And ICA, ProSISUR, of course, that have uh, helped us with this uh, topic and uh, as part of their international seminar. Uh, we never thought this would be reality, and, and it is. So thank you so much, Lourdes, and your entire team for their support. Thank you, Roberto. So I'm going to echo uh, Roberto's words of thanks to the speakers, uh, Mr. Gutkovic, Roberto, and uh, Dr. Quijano, for the excellent uh, presentations and moderation. I wanted to also state a final comment before we close. The next session will be held on Monday. At the same time, this is the third panel. It's the early warning systems for present pests, pests that are present. And that's uh, this coming Monday. I'd like to uh, thank individuals that we don't see, but that make it uh, the event that it is. Inive Zuniga, Ricardo Fallas. Uh, who is our technician. También, all very uh, efficient. And a special thanks to uh, our interpreters, uh, and Luciana, for the excellent work today. And to all of you, I apologize for the uh, late conclusion and closure of this session. Have a wonderful 
night, wonderful afternoon. Remember, March uh, 22nd is our next session. Thank you so much. See you then. Goodbye. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Very much. Adios. Thank you. Adios. Gracias. Bye. Adios. Gracias.